and morning to those online. Welcome to this morning's gathering here at the Avenue Chapel and wherever you are viewing us from. News of the community. Andy and Donna are heading to Adelaide uh, to celebrate Andy's dad's life. So we keep him in our prayers. We celebrate Dave because of a job he has been doing. We won't be seeing a lot of him because it happens to be in Kuala Lumpur. So talk to Dave about his special job. Pray for Carolyn because there's a bit of there's going to be a bit of coming and going. Is there any other news we need to know? Meryl's moved. Meryl is now in a comfort zone where she can actually have a good night's sleep, not worry about next. So we're pleased with that. We also like to welcome our visiting speaker tonight, today, <laughs> Dave Brooker. Uh, you may have heard him before, but welcome as our speaker today. We gather together in the love of God and we celebrate the love of Jesus. We pray we can share this love with those we meet anywhere. As we come together today, our hearts are filled with gratitude for the painstaking, careful stewardship of this land for many thousands of years by its traditional owners, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. This land was stolen, never ceded. It will always be Aboriginal lands. As we worship this morning, in our words and music, our prayers and silence, we hold our Wurundjeri elders, past, present and emerging, in the highest esteem. We especially welcome with respect, any First Nation people present with us today here or online. We extend this respect and gratitude to all the traditional owners of lands on which our online community live, work and worship in Australia and elsewhere in the world. We are the body of Christ, light and shade, gradations of colour and tan, mixing and melding, unresolved and restless, dissonance and ever moving towards the heartbeat of your universe and the glorious harmony of unity, your name. Let's pray together. Lord, we gather together this morning and give thanks for the marvellous season of autumn. We see the signs of summer's passing in golden leaves, shortening days, misty mornings and the glow of dusk. The brilliant colours of the leaves all around us remind us of the wonder of your creation. We sense the passing of summer in rain that dampens and winds that chill. We give thanks for these reminders of the naturalness of change in our lives. 
as expressed in the magnificence of autumn. We pray that the beauty of our world may be expressed in our own lives. As the cooler temperatures drift in, let us feel your warm and loving presence. May we find comfort in the consistency of the seasons when the world around us seems to be constantly changing. We know that each time has purpose and meaning. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. We are grateful you are present with us in all circumstances, in every season and situation. We thank you for the abundance in our lives and for the blessings you give us. We pray that we continue to see God's light on the path ahead. We turn our thoughts to our wider community, to those who are suffering or in need. Barb mentioned Andy and his family. We silently remember them and others and cast our minds to them now. We think of the many people in our community and in wider Australia who are suffering without adequate support. Help them. And in the wider world, we open our hearts to those in need of aid and support. We pray for our friends in Zambia and we pray for quick resolution of the new but age-old conflicts we're learning about in Sudan and the ongoing struggles in Ukraine and Russia. Release all those who are suffering and bring peace. In the wondrous name of Jesus, these things we pray. Amen. Let's stay seated for this song.
morning's Bible reading comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. The walk to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognising him, and he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since, since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that he had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead of them as he was going on as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Well, thanks for uh, the invitation to be uh, here. I don't feel like I'm a guest speaker, but <laughs> it has been um, it has been a couple months since I stood here. Um, in a moment of madness, uh, one of the things that the um, church board asked me to do before I finished was to prepare. Um, a schedule of guests for the rest of the year. And uh, you've, you've got some brilliant guests coming up. So um, next month, Craig Brown, um, so June, July, Lynette Leach, August, Kim Thode, September, Greg Elsden. Um, I can't remember, October, November. Matt Cutler's in there somewhere, I'm in there somewhere again. Uh, so, um, but in, in a moment of madness, I thought, oh, I'll do three weeks in May. <laughs> and then I went away and on my, uh, came back and thought, gee, it's May already. <laughs> <laughs> well, April anyway. And uh, so today is the first um, of three weeks on the theme of about God. And... Uh, uh, we'll ex- I, I'm, I'm keen to explore um, some of my thinking, but also some of our thinking about 
about the nature of God. I'm, I'm really conscious that the, the, the series title about God is problematic in so many ways. The, the use of the word about may imply that I'm going to tell you what you need to think about well, nothing could be further from the truth because I don't know the answer to that question. What I want to do is invite us into dialogue about what we uh, think about God. And in the, the final week, we'll actually have a chance to uh, do some dialogue around that. And then the use of the, the word God is problematic because I know when I use the word God, I mean something different to many other people. You know, we, we all have our own understanding and concept of what we mean by that word God. And, um, you know, I'm I trying to find an alternative word, but I couldn't come up with something that would capture what I want to share and, and uh, what I want us to do together over the next few weeks. So God it is. But um, I'm going to be inviting you to sort of put aside some of your preconceptions about what God might mean and entertain some other possibilities and then explore um, your own journey and your own thinking and your own experience and feeling about what you might mean by God. So, here we go about God. Perhaps you have to be a child of the 70s to really appreciate it, but that song represented a cultural shift. In a generation of rational thinkers into a pretty conservative world where reason and intellect were king, came this others like it, that represented a radical new culture, a world of mystical apparitions and psychedelic experience. Now, unfortunately, much of that mystical experience was drug-induced, <laughs> meaning that it sort of lacked credibility and, and lacked sustainability. The new world that it supposedly offered was never going to replace the eminently more sensible world of thought and prudent practice. And eventually even the Beatles abandoned their mystical quest and went back to writing more commercially saleable music. Well, the world of theology was undergoing a parallel journey, albeit a little later than uh, the world of secular music. When I commenced at what was then the College of the Bible in 1978, the same time that Meryl was uh, beginning her journey at the college, um, the theological and Christological theme of the day was the quest for the historical Jesus. And uh, the reading list that I had in the uh, early Christological subjects included books like um, the ones on the screen there, books by I.H. Marshall, Marshall, Otto Betts, C.H. Dodd and um, Edward Skillybeck and uh, a whole lot of others exploring this quest for the historical Jesus. The aim of the quest was to get behind the text of the Gospels and other literature by asking, what can we really know about the historical Jesus in the belief that proving the historicity of Jesus would convince people to put their faith in him? A, a very rational exercise for a very rational generation. During the uh, 1980s, a new movement emerged, exemplified by uh, writers like Matthew Fox, um, some of the, the books of his books that I have on my bookshelf include um, Original Blessing, We, 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 All the Way Home, On Becoming a Musical Mystical Bear, and The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. Um, 
And in his writing, Matthew Fox attempted to recalibrate uh, the understanding of, of the nature of faith by focusing on the mystery of God and, and the mystical experiences of Jesus. Trouble is, uh, in the 1980s, uh, Fox's writings only served to get him disciplined by the Catholic Church, uh, who revoked his license to teach within their orthodox institutions. Because in the 1980s, the church generally was no more ready for mystical interpretations of the gospel than the world was for mystical musical experiences. Uh, then the next wave in theological scholarship during the 1990s and beyond was focused around the Jesus Seminar, a quest to uh, identify uh, and, and codify the real words of Jesus. What did, you know, in, in the gospel story, what words did Jesus really say? The theory being that if we can authenticate the real words of Jesus, then we'll be able to separate the core teaching of Jesus from the extraneous editions of the early church. Uh, excellent books like Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time by Marcus Borg and Honest to Jesus by Robert Funk and the, the uh, rather brilliant five gospels which uh, sort of colour codes the words of Jesus in the New Testament into five of, uh, of colour ranging from um, uh, very unlikely that Jesus said it to extremely likely that Jesus said it. More recently, writers like um, Richard Rohr and uh, Bruce Sanguin and Peter Rollins and Cynthia Burgo and Eckhart Tolle and others have invited the church to refocus on the more mystical, spiritual dimensions of faith, offered a fresh lens through which to view the Gospels. Now, why this history lesson? Because as we begin our dialogue about God, I want to invite you to let go of some of your preconceptions of all of the familiar and comfortable images and understandings you have about God and, and sort of walk with me into a potentially new way of talking about God and experiencing God. The passage that Trevor read to us this morning is one of the more familiar post-resurrection stories from the Gospel. And it's a good place for us to start with our recalibration of language and thought about God. It, it's a story that, to my mind anyway, doesn't make a lot of sense if it's taken literally or perhaps even metaphorically. To my mind, it comes alive when read through a mystical lens as a story about the dawning awareness of the real presence of the mystical Christ, the mystical God. Uh, let's look at a few of the verses from the story itself that um, I think support my thinking about this. Uh, early in the story, we read, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. Now, what on earth does that mean? How would they have failed to recognise someone who was so obviously very significant to them unless that person was appearing to them or coming amongst them in a very different form? A mystical presence, perhaps. And then in verse 27... The strange conversation with Jesus concludes with the words, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the things about himself in all the scriptures. Now, how long would that take? How long would that take? I, I, you know, what do you reckon, Bobby? A long time? A long, long time. Absolutely. I, I don't know how long it takes to walk for, to Emmaus, but I reckon it wouldn't have been enough time. So there's something else going on. 
Is this a real conversation with the physical Jesus or can it be understood as a rigorous discussion between two pilgrims that leads to dawning insight as they grapple with the scriptures and finally get it? Finally gain insight into who and what Jesus was. Uh, So is, is Jesus' participation in this conversation physical or is it mystical? And then at verses 30 and 31, when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he vanished from their sight. Now, according to the story, they've had this first encounter and then they've had this long conversation. At what point are they not going to recognise Jesus if he's physically with them? But something happens in the breaking of bread. Uh, the... the um, gospel euphemism for communion for that time we spend in intimate connection with each other and with God and something happens and he's revealed it then suddenly he's gone so he's not really there at all isn't this the greatest mystical moment of them all how God is revealed to them in the breaking of bread but is acknowledged as not being there at all their eyes are open they recognize vanish from their sight surely this is a mystical experience written into the story very intentionally as a reference to or or perhaps a parallel to the early church's practice and experience of the Lord's Supper. Now I know that um, there are probably holes in this argument and I'm quite prepared to accept that one could argue that the text supports a physical presence of Jesus although Personally, I uh, think most of the post-resurrection stories uh, make more sense when uh, they're understood through that mystical lens. But whatever position you prefer to take, can I invite you to entertain for a moment the idea that this story is about a deeply mystical experience because I want to invite you to reflect on parallel experiences from your own journey. Have you not also experienced moments of deep awareness of the mystical presence of God? Perhaps in the stillness of the... or the grandeur of the ocean. Perhaps in the delight of children or the pleasure of family perhaps in a moment of meditation or in the deep connection of a small group. Haven't you experienced that deep sense of the presence, the mystical presence of God in moments such as those? Uh, As as a bit of a side, um, last Sunday Michael asked me if uh, today was going to be a a slideshow of my uh, recent holiday. (laughs) And I suggested to him that that would take three hours. It it occurred to me it would take as long as it would take to walk to Emmaus. But um, (laughs) but I might say that the photos you're seeing are actually from our uh, our recent uh, time away. Manning Clark is um, a a historian, obviously a late historian, Australian historian, and um, he characterised himself as an atheist. But I want to read you an excerpt from his autobiography, which was called The Quest for Grace, which I think um, questions his self-characterisation significantly. Says Manning Clark, Well, I knew about life's wildness, but I'd never discovered any God, any man, any woman, any work of art, either literature or painting to calm the storm within. I had read about Gothic cathedrals, about the spire reaching up from heaven, from earth to heaven as a symbol of man's hunger to be reunited with the divine. But at that time, late November 1938, I was impatient with, scornful, even contemptuous of all God-botherers, all that-sided people. From 
I had learned the distinction between those who were desitig, this sided, and those who were yensitig, that or other sided. I believed myself to be a sound desitig man. My concern was here and now, not in and with some future time and place. I scoffed, I scoffed at and mocked all knee benders, all petitioners, all grovelers at the throne of grace. One cold afternoon late in November 1938, Dimpfner and I travelled to Cologne on the Rheinverband. One of the party suggested we go into Cologne Cathedral. Impatient as ever, thinking we may as well have a look at this museum of a dying and doomed faith, I skipped up the steps. Inside the cathedral, I was strangely moved. Dymphna, knowing what was going on inside me, left me alone to feast on it all in my heart. I walked behind the high altar and saw by a stone wall the painting of the Madonna, the one referred to in Heine's poem, painted on golden leather. The sight of that face worked a great marvel within me. The tempests within subsided. The ghosts from the past stopped tormenting me. I will go back there every time I return to Germany. I will read of many men and women who have known a moment of grace while contemplating the Madonna in Cologne Cathedral. But I could not speak of the experience then to anyone. Was there anyone who would understand? Many years later, when I risked talking about the experience, my whole body shook. I will never forget that moment. I had been vouchsafed a vision of what I had previously searched for in vain. I get goosebumps every time I read that excerpt from his autobiography. Because to my mind, what Clark is describing is an experience of the mystical presence of God. Or, or perhaps it's the presence of the mystical God. And it's significant that from that moment on, whether he was physically present with the painting or simply talking about the experience of it, the mystical God became real for him. Again and again and again. Have we not all had such experiences? Experiences of the holy. Those moments when the skin tingles from our awareness of something beyond us. When we feel a sort of warmth flood our insides in response to a touching story or a magnificent landscape or a, or a special piece of music or a moment of deep connection with a friend or a loved one. Or, or when we feel a deep sense of peace or, or calm or love at the core of our being while engaging in some reflective practice. We all have these experiences and, and, and not just those of us who claim to be people of faith, but all people, all people, even avowed atheists like Manning Clark, have these experiences. Mostly they're uh, serendipitous, they take us by surprise, and we probably don't label them as holy or as experiences of God, because like those two people on the road to Emmaus, we don't tend to live in, in expectation of such encounters. But we do experience such moments and they do impact upon us. And for those who have eyes to see, they may reveal themselves as moments of awareness of the mystical presence of God. But there's more. While often these experiences are prompted by external 
stimuli, the experience itself is actually internal. It is felt and known within us. And once felt, it no longer depends upon the external factor like Manning Clark and his Cologne Cathedral experience. We can recall and relive the experience at almost any time. Why is that? Well, I want to suggest it's because the mystical God that we are experiencing is not beyond us, not external to us, but is within us, is internal. We mistakenly and futilely embark on a quest to connect with a God who is beyond us, who is external to us, who resides somewhere out there, when all the time that God is within us is part of our makeup, is essentially us. I believe is the wonderful mystery, the mystical awakening, the the teaching of Jesus. Not that God is somewhere out there, or that God is so holy that God couldn't possibly tolerate or relate to us sinners, or or that God is a mystery that we will never comprehend, but rather that God is with us. And that God with us really does mean God within us. And, And that nothing can separate us from the love of God really does mean that you and I are God bearers, God carriers. Actually, I want to say it's more than that. It's stronger than that. That that God is an integral and essential part of who we are and that just maybe we are an integral and essential part of who God is. I reckon that this is what Jesus was pointing to when he said, I and the Father are one. And that when he said, where I am, there you will be also, he was indicating that we and God are also one. Interestingly, there's an element of teaching and yearning in virtually every faith group. The the teaching um, of the Buddha on enlightenment, the wisdom of the Quran, especially as it's interpreted by the Sufi stream of Islam, the the quest for fulfillment in Hindu in the Hindu system, the, the Sikh teaching that God is revealed through an active, creative and practical life and um, the inner light of the Ekenka faith and, and on and on and on. So many different faith groups there have the same conclusion that somehow the mystical God is present within us. Not beyond us, not external to us, but deep, deep within us. I want to invite you to reflect on that concept during this coming week before we come back together next week and explore a little more about God. I believe the faith of Jesus... I don't know what I'm up to here. There we go. I believe the faith of Jesus is not that God is some external being or force that we humans must honour and obey or else, but that God in some deeply spiritual and mystical way is within us, is part of us. That God, however we choose to name God, is actually the best purest, most creative and constructive elements of our essential human nature. And that any quest to experience God, to know God, best starts within, with the quest to know ourselves, with the quest to claim and revel in and cherish those holy moments of deep awareness 
of the mystical presence of God within us. Sort of feel like I should play Magical Mystery Tour again to finish, but uh, you can sing that quietly to yourselves if you wish to. Amen. Welcome to this meal we share as we celebrate the love and forgiveness of Jesus. We have focused today our theme about God. David has talked about seeing but not recognising Jesus. Do we recognise God in our lives? When we focus on God's love is always there. Jesus taught his disciples about God. In turn, we learnt about God's love, God's unconditional love. We read in Corinthians about this meal, God's love and forgiveness. We just have to acknowledge Jesus. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, broke it, and when he had given thanks, he said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took a cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord God, we give thanks for your love, your forgiveness, and for your son Jesus. The bread, blessed and broken and shared. The wine is blessed and poured and shared. We take, eat and remember Christ is our Lord. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for your love we thank you for your strength and we thank you for being in us. As we come to the benediction, in our news I forgot to say, please be with John as Anne's dad is not good. May the God of peace, the Father of Jesus, who has shown us such love and in his grace has given us such unfailing encouragement and such hope, still encourage and strengthen us in word and deed during our week. Through the love of God, Amen. We look to Bobby to lead us in our benediction song. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rain fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may 
God hold you in the palm of his hand. May God hold you in the palm of his hand.